amen, amen, yeah. Woo, even when I don't feel it, he's working. Even when I don't see it, he's working. He never stops. He never stops working. Boy, that is the absolute truth. God is always at work around you, right? Yeah. God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that's real and perfect. God invites you to join him in what he's doing. He speaks to you by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. When he speaks to you, it always leads to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. Yeah, yeah, that's God. That's what happens. That's how we experience God. That's what he's doing. Thank you, thank you, John. I told John, I said, you're gonna have to do yeoman's work today because Justin's on vacation and uh, they out of the country. So they're somewhere, I don't even know where they are. But anyway, I said, you're gonna have to sing everything. He said, well, you know, John, he's that strong, silent type. I don't know if y'all, I don't know if y'all picked that up or not, but yeah, you've got that. He's got that, he's got that disease where he's got those big bumps all over him, those knots, those big, I've been praying for him for years. I told him, I said, I don't know, John, I can't get him off, man. I, I can't pray him. It just won't, won't work. He just, you know, when he comes out, watch him. You, he'll have those knots like right in here and right in here. I mean, mm, but anyway, we need to pray for John. All right, <clears throat> you guys, <laughs> you guys ready? All right, remember, we're, we're dealing with the four laws of love, and I've, I've made a guarantee to you and the guarantee is a 100% guarantee of success if you obey these laws. These four laws, simple, simple, four laws, not a bunch of them and complex stuff here and there. Four simple laws of love, then you will be successful in your marriage. I mean, you will have a happy marriage. You will be blessed in your marriage. You will like being married. It will be a wonderful experience for you. If you don't, uh, all bets are off. <laughs> That's all I can say. Because uh, these are the laws that God set up for relationships, and, um, and they govern relationships. And look, it's, I mean, this is not just some little simple uh, sermon, uh, you know. This is the Word of God, and this is, you know, you know, God, you know it, it's God that established marriage, right? You know, it, a ma marriage was not established by the state. Uh, it wasn't established by some lonely Neanderthals either. Uh, it wasn't established by some federal mandate or a government or something. Now, they keep messing with it and trying to make it something else. But God is the one who established marriage between a man and a woman. And he said, and here are the rules. And here, here they are. Tan, put the verse up for me, please, out of Genesis. There we go. And in, in verse 24 and 25, as soon as God brings Eve to Adam and says, all right, here's what I promised you. And he goes, you know, he goes, wow, God. She has skin like my skin, but I like her skin better. You know, she has bones like my bones, but woo, I like her bones better. That's what he really said before this. Not that little sterile, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She'll be called woman because she came out of man. Man with a womb is what woman means, by the way. Uh, so you're not gonna be a woman. I don't care how hard you try. You ain't gonna have a womb and nothing's coming out of it. So quit trying. Every cell in your body says male or female. They'll dig you up 100 years from now, get some DNA out of you, and it'll say, if you're a male, it'll say XY, and if you're a female, it'll say XX. No matter how much you try, you hit. God only created two kinds of, two genders of humanity, male and female. Sad to report that to, to some of these news agencies and some of these government uh, committees and so forth. But God, uh, that's God, and that's what he did. And, and, and if you want to know what God thinks about it, Psalm 2 says he laughs. God, God laughs at him. That's what it says. Psh, not worried. Anyway, let me go on. So here's the first law. First law is, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother. That is the law of priority. <clears throat> which means nothing comes ahead of your marriage. If your marriage is first, it works. If it's not first, it won't work. And he used the greatest of all relationships to show you just how important a priority it is because you have no greater priority until you get married than the priority you have to your mother and father. It's the greatest of all relationships. But when you get married, you leave it, 
Now your wife is your priority, and that's number one in your life. The second law is, and cleave to his wife, and this cleave to his wife is the word uh, davak, and davak means to glue or to weld, and then the third meaning says to pursue with all your energy. So the second law deals with expending energy, all your energy on your mate, to serve them, to, uh, to meet the needs in their life. Because you remember, uh, when you enter a marriage relationship, um, you do this because there are some needs in your life that you can't meet on your own. You have, you, have some, you have some emotional needs and some social needs and, and, uh, and mental needs and, and, and physical. You, you have all kind of needs that, that you cannot meet your, on your own. And so you are attracted to someone who can meet those needs. And then you enter a covenant relationship with that person. And now you are in a relationship. You can't meet your own needs and you're sworn to fidelity which means you can't shop at another store. So you are at the mercy of your mate to provide, to love you enough to provide your needs and to take care of those things in life. Pursue with all your energy is never quit serving. Never quit doing what you did when you were attracting each other Keep on doing that. Make your store attractive. Do everything you did. Be careful about the way you live and talk and all. Anyway, law number three. Third law is, uh, and they too shall become one flesh. Now that's just a simple little statement, but it is the most powerful statement about, uh, about unity this, that you can find in the Bible, about two becoming one. And what it's, what it's dealing with here is the fact that we're a team that we are not just people who are living in the same house together, who share some children and share a bank account or an address. You married the person you married because you wanted to share your life with them. You found someone that meets your needs. You fell in love and you married them so that you could share this life together. And so, sadly, many people describe their marriage as growing apart. Uh, uh, Pastor, pray for me. Uh, my marriage is in trouble. Uh, uh, we just seem to be growing apart. Well, that's an oxymoron, actually, in marriage, because if you're growing, you're not growing apart. You're growing together. If you're growing apart, you're not growing. You're dying. Your marriage is dying, actually. Because uh, God intended for us to become one. We are a team. We're, we're, we're partnership. Now, the fourth law. The fourth law is, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Naked. Uh, dealing with uh, our presentation. Uh, I, I use the word presentation because, you know, the others are peas and I got to get an alliteration. I'm, I'm just a preacher. Forgive me for that. But... but you know, you have, <laughs> you have priority, pursue, partnership, and presentation. Presentation just simply means, it, it's the word arom. And what it, arom means is to be, it, it means to be, to be bare. It, it means to be totally exposed. It means unhindered access. Nothing in the way. Nothing hiding, nothing, nothing protect, oh, openness. And so the Bible says this is how Adam and Eve was before sin came into the garden. They were totally open. Not just open physically, guys, but open emotionally, spiritually, psychologically, <laughs> socially, you know, emotionally. They had, it means to be totally unhindered and, and bare in, in your in access. And, and so before sin came into the garden, God created Adam and Eve and put them together and, 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 and gave them a marriage that uh, was the most intimate relationship 
on earth. So we can conclude then that marriage is intended to be the most intimate relationship that any of us will have on earth and, and there can only be intimacy when there is a Rome, a, a bear, a openness, a, a nothing hidden, a unhindered access. Totally. I know many people read this and they think, well, yeah, they were naked. They were pornographically, and I'm just using that word to mean physically, sexually naked. But I'm not sure, and now this is just a thought of mine, so don't tell Jesus one day it's a ticket to heaven, all right? This is just something I think. The, the Lord led Israel by his Shekinah glory. Shekinah means outward, visible. God led Israel by a pillar of cloud by day. Wherever the cloud went, that's where they went. That cloud was the Shekinah glory of God. And like a giant air conditioner in the desert, it kept them from being burnt up in the hot desert sun. And then at night, the cloud changed into a pillar of fire that encamped itself in, in, in their camp. And like a supernatural heater, the, the wind blew through the fire and it warmed them at night. That was the Shekinah of God. I believe that Adam and Eve were, was covered with the Shekinah of God. I believe that they were glorious when they were created. They had no sin, they had no fault in them, and that God clothed them with his Shekinah glory. And when they fell, they fell all the way from light to leaves, and they tried to cover themselves because they were ashamed. Now, that's just a theory. But Adam and Eve were completely able to be open in their, with their minds, emotions, dreams, spirit, and their bodies with each other without shame and without any fear whatsoever of rejection. They were complete, they could have complete intimacy. This was true until sin came into the garden. When sin came into the Garden of Eden, immediately they began to hide themselves from God and from each other. Therefore, this wonderful openness, this total exposure on every level of life, they no longer had. Because intimacy is not possible in a cover-up environment. Intimacy is only possible in an openness environment. When you, when you are safe for me, let me, let me explain that. They, they became unsafe for each other. When, when, when you are sinning against me, whether you, it is something you're doing or something you're saying, I can't take a chance of being intimate with you because I can't take the chance that whatever I say to you, you're not going to use it against me one day because I don't feel that you are safe. For, for, for me. Sin stops that closeness and that intimacy. Remember, all right, let me, let me show what I mean. Remember, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came to Adam, and you remember what he asked him? He said, Adam, what is this that you've done? Mm -hmm. Where are you, man? Been looking for you. Why are you, why are you trying to hide? Uh, did you eat of the tree that I told you not to eat of? Uh, my, it, my wife did it. My wife got, it's that woman you gave me, God. That, you gave me a bad woman. I'm telling you, if, you, if, I, if you'd have given me a better woman, I wouldn't have done that. So who is Adam, Adam, what's Adam doing? Adam is saying, it's not my fault, taking no responsibility for his own action, but it's either God, it's either, it's your fault for giving me a bad woman, or it's Eve's fault for being so seductive in life. Then God went to Eve, and God said to Eve, Eve, uh, what is this you've done? And she said, um, the devil made me do it. So neither one of them took responsibility for their own behavior, and, and, and now they couldn't trust each other, so trust went out the window, and when trust went out the in window, intimacy went out the window. Because 
Intimacy can only happen in an atmosphere of carefulness. You fell in love because you were careful. You went out on a date for the first time, second time, third time, maybe even the fourth time with a prospective mate, somebody that had a little potential to become the fulfillment of your needs in life. When you did that, you were careful. You were careful with what you said and you were careful with what you did. You fell out of love because you ceased to be careful. You began to say things and do things that are careless and hurtful. Therefore, I must cover myself up to protect myself from you because you are no longer careful. I can't share my thoughts with you. I can't share my heart with you. I can't share my dreams with you. I can't share my body with you. I, I, I can't trust you. So I can't be intimate with you. So let's talk about the two big killers of intimacy and, 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 and closeness in marriage. Let's talk about anger and conflict. Because no matter how great a relationship you have in life, there are times that you are going to have anger and conflict in your relationship. You may say, Pastor, I don't ever have any in my relationship. Well, that doesn't mean it's a good relationship. It, just, it could mean that one of you is dominating the other one. So it doesn't have to be something bad going on for, you not to be, for, for your relationship to be in conflict. Now, there's nothing wrong. Now, now hear me. There's nothing wrong with anger or conflict, but you must be able to process it together in your marriage or it becomes very destructive in life. One of, one of the major problems that we have in processing anger is that many of us, myself included, did not grow up in a home where we had good role models showing us how to deal with anger and conflict in marriage. To say, when, when I use the word uh, dysfunctional family, everybody in here goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, did anybody grow in here grow up in a functional family? I wish Justin was in here because he knows he did. But everybody else grew up in a dysfunctional family, right? Yeah, we, we all, we all, hey, I, I grew up on a dirt road in Meridian, Mississippi, in the country, a dirt road now, gravel road. And there were, eight or 10 houses on that same road. And uh, four or five of them had children about the same age as, as me and my, 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 three, my two sisters and brother. And so we were always together and we were always at their house and all, you know how that goes. Well, I can tell you how some of them handled anger and conflict. You know what they did? They just, they didn't look at each other. If, if, if one of them was mad with you, uh, they wouldn't make eye contact. They just walk by you like you weren't standing there. They wouldn't say anything to you. They wouldn't look at you. It was just like you just didn't exist. And that's the way they handled conflict and anger. You could tell they weren't angry with you anymore when they finally looked you in the eye. And then they say, okay, well, I guess you've forgiven me and everything's over. My family handled anger um, just to be honest with you, most of the anger in, in my family was directed at my father, who was an alcoholic. All of us were mad at him. So whatever happened in our house, it was his fault. So we children were rarely mad with each other because we were mad at him. We were, were rarely mad with my mother because we felt sorry for her because she had to be married to him. Lord saved him, thank the Lord, last 20 years of his life. He was a Christian, went to the church I pastored. I expect to see him in heaven when I get there. The change, total, total, total change, total change. Different man, different man. 
But that's how we handled conflict. And then some of the people in our neighborhood yelled and screamed at each other. When they got angry, it, it, man, they yelled some ugly things and some hurtful things and some harmful things. And then the other one would usually start crying and then the other one would come over there and start pampering and petting my old baby. I didn't mean to say that. You know I didn't mean that. You know daddy wouldn't. Do. And, then, and then they'd dry up and they'd make up and then they'd go on until something else happened and then they'd yell at each other. And, then, and that's how they handle conflict. Now, I'm not sure exactly how you would handle all of these situations, but the only thing I know about all of them is that they are all dysfunctional. None of those are the ways that you handle anger and conflict. That's the exact wrong thing to do. All right, let's look at four ways of dealing with anger. All right, four ways to deal with anger, just quickly for you. All right, number one, do not deny your anger. Look at the verse. I just, this verse, this Ephesians 4 is going to be on every, all four of these. But look, all right, it says, be angry and do not sin. This is Paul now talking to the church at Ephesus. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So the apostle Paul says that there is nothing wrong with anger. Hey, God gets angry. Jesus got angry when he was here on the earth. Anger is, is a normal, uh, healthy, emotional response for human beings. And you will never be spiritual enough where you will never get angry again. But one of the areas that we have to be careful to tell and to let you know, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I would imagine that, that many of you in here, like many people everywhere, are children of divorce. You either are a child of divorce or you married a child of divorce, one or the other. Now, I'm saying that because it's very common for children of divorce to have some very deep difficulties with this anger situation. Let me, let me read, this is an excerpt from a book uh, written by Judith Wallerstein, The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. The Unexpected Legacy of Divorce. It's just a paragraph, so let me read. Because children of divorce don't know how to negotiate conflict well, many reach for the worst solutions when trouble strikes. For example, some will sit on their feelings, not mentioning complaints or differences until their suppressed anger blows sky high. Others burst into tears and are immobilized or retreat into themselves or the next room and close the door. But the most common tendency is to run away at the first serious disagreement and wrestle with unconscious demons. This is because from the perspective of a child of divorce, any argument can become the first step in an inevitable chain of conflict that will destroy their marriage. So if you are a child of divorce, or if you're married to a child of divorce, this anger issue is very serious. The first step in dealing with it is to understand where you are. To understand that you were not properly trained as you grew up through your family to learn or to know how to resolve conflict. You didn't see it modeled for you. Your parents didn't model it. Your relatives didn't model it. You didn't see anyone with a proper response to conflict or, or, or anger management. And so many of us didn't have any models when we grow up. But if you're a child of divorce, let, let me just say to you, listen, don't fear anger. Just because anger was the beginning of the end of your parents' marriage doesn't mean that, that, that anger is gonna end your marriage because you can deal with anger. I mean, seriously, you, there's a way to deal with anger that does not end in an explosion and, and, the, and the breaking of a marriage. And, don't, and, and look, and don't feel guilty about your anger. When, when you get angry, uh, you're not saying that, that your anger is right. 
I mean, there are some real reasons to become angry, right? I mean, if somebody mistreats me, somebody abuses me, I should get angry about that. So there are some legitimate reasons for being angry, but, but many times anger is not caused by something legitimate. It's caused by misunderstanding or immaturity or unrealistic expect, expectations or stress. Uh, so, so I'm not saying that, that my anger is right. I'm just saying that my anger is real. And I need to express it so that we can process this in our family. The hallmark of dysfunction you don't know what it is? Silence. Freeze them out. Go to bed, turn your back toward them so that they don't even have the comfort of feeling like you're still alive anymore. You know, breathe lightly. You're punishing them. The hallmark of dysfunction. I can't, I can't be real in my own family. I can't, I, I, I can't, I can't, I can't uh, feel anything. I can't talk it out loud. In a functional family, you can have feelings, you can talk about your feelings, and it doesn't mean you're ruled by your feelings, or you let your feelings just uh, run wild and express them in any way, or not. But, 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 you can, but, but you can have them, and, and you can be open about them, and you can talk about it. Because if you don't deal with your anger, what's gonna happen? Lots of terrible things happen when we, when we swallow our anger, right? I heard once somebody, refrigerator verse said, when you swallow your anger, your stomach keeps score. All kind of physical issues are caused by that. Emotional issues, psychological issues, all kind of issues. When you bottle up your anger, it, it doesn't go away. It just hangs, uh, hangs around and causes all kind of problems. Uh, so in our homes, we have, to, we have to cultivate an environment of honesty so that our mate can be honest with us. And when I say this, I know you're going to go, ooh, this is going to be hard. All right. This is a suggestion. Um, there needs to be a time when you allow your mate to be honest with you without having to pay a price. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, uh, we, we, we make them pay sometimes, don't we? But when they say certain stuff or do things, you're going to pay for that, buddy, right? You're going to put the discomfort on them. You're going to let them know you didn't like that. There needs to be a time for all of us where we can sit down, get a cup of coffee, whatever, uh, whatever kind of uh, 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 environment you want to create for this, and just say, look, all right, hon, um, I, here, I wanna know how everything, I don't wanna know how we doing, all right? Uh, uh, I, I want you to just be honest with me. You can tell me anything, and, I, and I'm not gonna make you pay a price for it. And then, and then get ready, because uh, they may tell you something, <laughs> may tell you, something you, might, you might not, well, you are mighty childish, that's all I got to say. Or, Maybe so. Now they don't. They're not going. They don't have to say it ugly and attacking and all of that kind of stuff. It's just tell me, you know, tell me what we need to do, and and I'm not going to make you pay the price because you know you can't talk to some people because every time you try to talk to them, they just go ballistic, like like a bomb waiting to go off, and you have one little tiny cr critical thing, and, and and it just blows them up. Look, you gotta be, you can tell somebody something and be kind about it, be tactful about it, be, be, be loving about it. But if you, if you need to talk to them about something that has made you angry and you don't tell them, then how are they going to know? Don't do that anymore or do it in a different way because it's really causing a problem in our relationship. Let me talk to you about a customer relations counter. I want you to, we need to develop, I, I, I just thought about this with, when I was thinking about shopping. Where, where do people love to shop probably as much as anywhere in the world? Walmart. Why do they love to shop at Walmart? Well, not only do you get uh, name brand stuff for cheap prices, but y'all do know that it's really kind of cheaper stuff. It's made for Walmart. You do, oh, never mind. I don't want to bust anybody's bubble. But, 
But you get, you know, good stuff for a cheap price. But here's the main reason. Here's the main reason. Main reason is, if you don't like it, you can take it back. <laughs> That's right. If it doesn't fit, if it's the wrong color, if it's defective, you can take it back and get your money back. All you do is you go in that store, you go over to the customer relations counter or the customer service counter, whatever you want to call it, and you say, I got this and, and I don't like it. And they'll say, okay, sir, uh, just lay it right there. And they'll run a scanner over. And about, you want that back on your card? Uh, yeah. All right. And no hassle, no guilt, no hundred questions about... Well, you know, did you wear it or did you use it or has this been, you know, you got a box full of stuff piled up. They don't even ask you any questions. They just say, uh, is it broken? You know, well, I don't know. It's in so many pieces I can't tell, but I think it is uh, broken. Well, okay, put it down and you get your money back. I, I tell you, Tanya's running the risk of being black flagged down there. Are, have y'all, uh, has anybody in here ever been black flagged at Walmart? You know, you can get black flag. Did you know that? What that means is you, you take so much stuff back, eventually you get black flag. It's like, mm -mm, you, can't, you, can't, you can't buy something here because you bring it back every time. So anyway, uh, the customer relations now. All right, what we need, well, no matter how good a store is, they know that sooner or later they're going to have a problem, right, with a customer. So they have a customer relations counter already ready so that when one something happens, they just go to the customer relations counter. And the people there are friendly. They're, they're good people, persons. They're, they've been instructed not to hassle and argue with people and all of that kind of stuff. Well, look, in our, we all have a customer relations counter in our life. When we have problems, our mate comes and, 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 they, and they come to our customer relations counter. Now you have one, whether you know it or not. Now your customer relations counter is either open, like Walmart, or it's restrictive, <laughs> like some of these high market stores that you never shop in because you don't like that. So you have one of those kind of customer relations. All right, let, 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 me, let me show you how your customer relations counter should work. When your mate comes to you, you just say, hon, uh, I, I, I want to be your department store of love. And I, I'm trying to include everything in my store that I think you'll, that I think you'll like but now, remember, I'm not perfect. So if you ever have a complaint, you just come right on over here to the customer, customer relations counter and, and, and I'm gonna give you a new one. That's what I'm gonna do. You can have a new one. That's the way, if we have anger, if we have conflict in our lives, we, 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 we gotta have a place that it can be resolved or else it just continues on. All right, so don't deny your anger. Number two, don't justify sin when you're angry. That says be angry and do not sin. What that means is, look, when you get angry, you have an opportunity to sin, and so don't justify it by saying, it's all right, I, I, I was just mad. It's, I, I'm amazed at how many people do the exact opposite of what they should do, and then they have the audacity to be surprised when it doesn't work. Look, you ha here, here's one good little general thought in life about, ha about handling anything. What is it that you want? What do you want? You gotta decide what it is you want. Do I want them to be sweeter? Do I want them to talk softer? Do I want them to put their arm around me? Do I want them to say loving things to me? Uh, do I want them to quit uh, uh, being sarcastic? What, I mean, what is it that you want? And then you develop a strategy to get you what you want. And if what you're doing is not getting what you want, Quit doing it. 
and do something else. That's all it boils down to. I'll guarantee you that most anger in marriage would be solved if you would just do that one thing right there. You just keep pressing it. You just keep hammering it. You just keep driving it. And it, 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 it's not working, and it's just making it worse and worse and worse and worse. You know, you've heard the old saying, when you, when you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Yeah, stop digging. Well, that's exactly what, all right, don't just, don't, don't sit there and say, okay, what I'm doing is all right because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just angry. Remember that you can only defeat a spirit with the opposite spirit. You, if you're fighting fire with fire, let me tell you what you're getting, a bigger fire. If you're fighting spite with spite, you get, you get more spite. You, everybody's more spiteful. If, if, if you're uh, uh, fighting hate with hate, everybody's going to become more hateful. What do you fight fire with? Water, you know? What do you fight spite with? Uh, how, about, how about service? How about humility? And hate, what do, you, what do you use to fight hate? Well, what about love? Uh, that would be the opposite of that. And that's how you begin to battle. You can't, you can't counsel a spirit away. It has to be defeated by the opposite spirit. Okay, I'll go on. Number three. Don't go to bed on your anger. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. There's nothing wrong with today's anger. We all have anger for every day. Something is out of whack, something didn't work right, blah, blah, blah. All right, today's anger is today's anger. And I need to process today's anger today. The problem comes with yesterday's anger. If I carry yesterday's anger into today, that's where the problem, that, that's where de destructive anger comes from. I, I'm carrying it over, and I'm, and, I'm, and, I'm not, and I'm not dealing with it every day. One of the best practices to establish is to determine that we are not going to go to bed on anger. And this obviously is more difficult than just saying it. It is. When you're mad and your pride's been hurt and you, you know, you're falling back on all that dysfunction of your past. You know, you know what all that dysfunction of your past is, right? It's a word for it the Bible uses. It's iniquity. Iniquity. Iniquity overall means sin, but it's a special kind of sin. A mis iniquity means to twist or to bend, to disfigure is what iniquity is. All of your life, from your parents, from your siblings, from your teachers, from mentors in your life, and maybe from your environment, your iniquity has been placed into your life. Dysfunction a twisting of God's rules, a twisting of God's law. And it happens so slowly, you don't even notice it. And so many things you do that you think are right, you do it because of iniquity. Because that's the way you've been bent and twisted over the years, and now you think it's okay to do it that way. But, but no, no, you know, you got to, you know, don't go to bed on your anger because number four is, put that, don't give the devil a place in your marriage. The reason you don't go to bed on your anger is because, notice what the verse says, be angry and do not sin, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. So when you let the sun go down on your wrath, which just means you don't handle it quickly, that's, that's all I was talking about, I mean, it just means you, can, you need to handle your anger today. You don't need to carry it on tomorrow because you, you to, you'll have enough of, to, of tomorrow's anger to handle, so you don't need to drag yesterday's in there with it because it becomes unmanageable then. And also, according to this verse, if you let the sun go down on your wrath, you are giving an invitation to the devil, not, Diablos is the word that it uses, and you remember we did in that series on, on unmasking the devil, the word Diablos means accuser, slanderer. 
So what you're doing, if you let the sun go down on your wrath and you don't deal with today's anger today, you go to sleep and he slithers in because you've left the door open. You got anger in you. That's his invitation. Oh, I'm gonna go in there. Let me talk to you about it. <laughs> and he slithers in. And remember, he's stealthy now. He's stealthy. He doesn't just walk in there with a pitchfork and a pointed tail and say, I'm the devil, and uh, I got some advice for you. No, no. He comes in, he slithers. You don't even see him. You don't know he's there. And he just starts whispering. So all night while you think you're asleep, he's counseling you. This is what she meant by that. You, you know she's always been that way. Yeah, she meant it. You know she meant it. Did you see her eyes and her face? Oh, she was so angry and ugly about that. And when you wake up in the morning, you're going to be madder than when you went to bed that night because you have been counseled all night long by O Diablos. And let me tell you something else. Next morning, you're going to wake up believing stuff that's not even true. And you are going to be so entrenched in that belief that you're going to call your mate a liar when they disagree with what you've been deceived by. The enemy put it in you. You think it's real. You attack them. They go, what are you talking about? What? What? You, oh, you know you did it. And you just, boy, you are blowing up hot. You just know it happened. No, no, no. It didn't happen. You've been deceived. And that's how the devil does work. And because iniquity shall abound, it's a lot easier because he just takes advantage of your iniquity. Whatever weakness you have, he takes advantage of. Your parents taught you how to hide things from each other. That's iniquity. So you hide things from your mate because your iniquity taught you how to do that. And he takes advantage of your iniquity and uses it against you. Anyway, let me go. Enough of that psychology. All right, let me give you four steps now to resolving conflicts in marriage. That's how you handle anger. These will be quicker, all right? Uh, we'll get you out by the saints game, all right? All right, four ways. You know, we talk about anger and conflict, so let's look at four. All right, number one, on how do we resolve conflict, number one. Conflict, uh, confront in a loving and positive manner. All right, you're going to deal with your anger today. And, it, and, and you may have to take a few hours to cool off, but when you return, um, you, you, you need to confront the issue in a, in a, in a positive manner. Uh, Proverbs 15.1, that's what it says. Proverbs 15.1 says what? A soft answer turns away wrath but a harsh word stirs up anger. You know what that's saying? When you talk to people, be sweet. Be gentle. Be kind. Because if you do, you'll take away a lot of that fire out of them. If you, if you talk harsh, you're going to put more fire in there. So you just determine what you want to handle. I mean, you confront, I mean, right, communication experts tell us that no conversation ever rises above the first three minutes of that conversation. So in every conversation, in the first three minutes of that conversation, you get to decide how that conversation is gonna go. Is it gonna be successful or is it gonna be a failure? Here's the way you start a reconciliation conversation with your spouse. You're angry, you did, you, you got, you, you cooled off, you come up, you say, hon, uh, you know I love you. We've been married 43 years now. But I'm, up, I'm, uh, I'm upset uh, and, I, and I want to talk about it. Remember that, you know, I love you and I'm committed to you and we're on the same team and, and I'm glad I married you and I chose, I'd choose you all over again, but I'm upset and I, and I need to talk about this. That's how you start a reconciliation meeting. Or you could do it this way. Well, you've done it again. 
I thought we had it all worked out. Now you've gone and made me mad again. I, would, I just want you to know before we start talking that I've been on one uh, on one hour divorce dot com and I got the uh, form filled out and all I got to do is hit her is hit enter. But I want to give you a chance to apologize and and make it right before I do that. So go ahead. Yeah, good luck with that. That goes south quick, doesn't it? <laughs> so you have the choice to start a conversation in one of those ways. And the Bible says, if you'll, if you'll use a gentle word, if you'll start it in a gentle way, it'll be a lot more productive for you. Number two, number two way to handle conflict. Complain, I know that might surprise you. Complain, but do not criticize. Now there's a big difference between complaining and criticizing. They're not the same thing at all. When you open your public relations counter and you give, the, you give your mate the right to complain, um, that's not opening the door so to, to, to start criticizing. And here's the difference between complaining and criticizing. Uh, complaining is about me. Criticizing is about you. Here, here's, here's, what, here's what you don't do. This is criticizing. You said something to me a while ago, and, and, and I'm upset about it. And I know what you meant by it, because I know you, ju that's, you just like that. That's what you do all the time. All right, that is criticizing. It's all about you. It's all about you did this, you did that. I know what you meant. It's you, 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 you. It's like you're the judge, you met with the jury, you found them guilty, the sentence has been decided and you're going to give them a chance to confess and ask for leniency. So go ahead, take this moment. We hate that, don't we? I mean, we hate that. We hate that when people d determine what we mean or say before we ever even mean or say. I mean, our, sp our spouse is the judge, jury, and executioner, and they don't even care what we say about it. They don't even listen to what we say. They already have their mind made up, and they already have the sentence in the public, and they know everything without me ever even having to say anything. That's criticizing. This is what you do. This is complaining. You know you, said, I, you know, you said something to me this morning, and I don't know what you meant by it, but let me tell you how I feel. And I'm not saying I'm right, and I'm not saying that my feelings are right, because uh, I'm really not sure how to take it. Um, but I want to, let me talk, but let me tell you how it makes me feel. See, that's, that's, that's no attack. That's no accusation. You're not accusing them. You're, you're, you're not misinterpreting their motives. You're not judging them, penalizing them, punishing them. And so you can complain all you want because complaining is talking about you. Criticism is judgmental. It's very judgmental and very often wrong because Criticism is based on your interpretation of your spouse. It really says more about you than it does about your spouse. Number three. Number three, listen to your spouse and believe them. This goes really with what we were talking about a while ago when I was talking about being counseled by Diablos all night and you're now believing something that's not true. <laughs> it's not even real. All right, if you've gone to bed on anger and you believe things about your spouse that are wrong, when they begin to say things, when you say, this is what the deal, and they say, what, I, I don't remember saying that. I don't even remember having a conversation about that. What, what, are, what are you talking about? Uh, what this, what this says is believe them. Believe what they say. Let me read you a verse. 1 Corinthians 13. You know that whole chapter is about love. I'm gonna just start at verse four, read a couple, three verses. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. It doesn't seek its own. It's not easily provoked. Doesn't say it can't be, but it's not easy to do it. It's not easily provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. And the next line says, love never fails. Verse 8. Love never fails. Well, 
if you're going to have conflict resolution with your spouse, you are going to have to speak gently. You're going to have to keep that criticism out and then you listen to them and when they tell you what they mean, believe them. Let me give you an example. Hun, um, what did you mean yesterday when you said uh, blah, 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 blah? Well, I, I, don't even, I don't remember saying that. Did, did I say that yesterday? I, I don't even remember, I don't remember talking about that yesterday. I'm not, I'm not mad about anything. I, yes, you are, and you don't know. <laughs> I mean, how many, of you, how many conversations go like that? Uh, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It sounds ridiculous when somebody like me, I'm standing up here on the stage talking to all y'all and recounting a conversation. That, that conversation sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? You know why it sounds ridiculous? Because it is ridiculous. When they say they don't remember or I don't, I'm not sure I said that or whatever, believe what they say. That, that, in other words, don't start another argument. Yes, you did say it. You know what you said. Just believe. If they say, I don't know, I don't remember, okay, you don't know and you don't remember. Forgive me. I'm sorry for attacking, but I thought I heard that. Must have been the devil last night because I was mad all night long. Number four, forgive them. <laughs> forgive and let it go. That's a good way to look at the life. <laughs> forgive and let it go. You gotta let it go. All right. Let me talk to you about processing anger before you go to bed, even if your spouse won't participate with you. Let's say they're shut up, they won't talk, they won't get it out, uh, and you, and it's time to go to bed, you're about to pass out, they, you can't get it worked out, and you don't want to be laying in bed all night with the devil counseling you. Okay, what can you do? Well, before you go to bed, you can devil-proof your heart. And here's how you devil-proof your heart. You forgive them before you go to bed. You forgive them. What did they do? Uh, he was ugly to me today. Let it go. Forgive them. Lord, I'm upset. You know I'm upset. I love them. And, 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 I, and I don't want to hold anything against them. So Lord, I, I, I'm going to forgive. I'm going to forgive. I forgive them right now. I'm just, Lord, take that out of me. I, 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 I am forgiving. And, and Lord, protect my heart tonight from that weasel Diablo coming in and, and, and attacking me tonight. You might try using some of the most healing words in marriage. Words like, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> or, uh, I w oh, this one, I was wrong. Or, will you please forgive me? That works real good at getting stuff out of you. Out of you. All right, let me, st let's say that you're in an argument, something happened. One of you's 90% wrong and the other one's 10% wrong. All right. Which one of you is wrong. Well, both of you are wrong, right? If you're only 10% wrong, you're still wrong. And you, and, and, and you, you both need to repent and, and, and ask forgiveness because both of you are wrong. And even if you're the one that's 10% wrong, you need to say to your spouse, I am sorry for what I did, and I'm, or I'm sorry for what I said, or I'm sorry that I didn't get this done, or I'm, whatever the issue might be, will you please forgive me? Now, this is, I want to say this to you, and I want you to remember what I'm saying right now, because this is, I see this all the time, and it's ridiculous. And then they wonder why it doesn't work. You need, I don't, if you're, even if you're the 10%, you go to them and you say, hon, I'm, I, I'm so sorry I did that. Please forgive me. And, and then they'll most likely say, okay, I, or they'll say something about what it happened and then you can say, oh, I, I'm, I, I hate that. I didn't, I didn't mean for it to be like that. You know I love you and I, I'm so sorry that that hurts you that way. You, you, you get it, get it, get in there and get it. 
uh, none of this, uh, I'm sorry if I said something that hurt you. I'm sorry if you interpreted what I said to mean so and so, so and so, so. No, 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 no. You got to get that stuff out of there. There ain't no if involved in this. You know you said something wrong, and you know you hurt them because you meant to hurt them. And don't give it any of this, if I did this and if I did that. That's, that's not an apology. That's an accusation. You're actually accusing them. It's your fault that you got offended. I said something nasty, and then you got offended, but it's your fault. That's what you're saying if you say if. Don't, look, no, it, because here's the truth. You are not apologizing in order to escape the consequences. You are apologizing to repair the breach in your relationship that was caused by whatever this issue is. This issue, who, whichever one of you are right or wrong, has caused a breach in your relationship. This is what you're trying to fix and bring back together. You're not trying to prove who's right and who's wrong. And, and who's going to pay for it and get penalized. No, 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 that's not what forgiveness is about. Forgiveness is saying to, in, in, to yourself, man, I, I really hurt her. And I, Lord knows I wouldn't do that. I love her. And recognizing that, no matter whether she was the one that did wrong or not, if I want my relationship to be healed, I'm going to have to go to heal my relationship. And to heal my relationship means I caused hurt for her that has caused a breach in our relationship. And I don't want there to be a breach in our relationship. I want us to be tight. So whatever it was, even if it was a misinterpretation or if it was a, you know, something that got out of hand that I didn't even mean or anything, whatever it is, it's like you just go and you, and you apologize without ifs in there or anything like that, without criticism of the other one. In it. I did it and I'm sorry and I, I don't want our relationship to be breached, so please forgive me. I'll never do anything like that again. I love you, I, you know. Whatever, whatever you need to say. But don't blame them. That's not, that's not an apology, all right? So anyway, there you go. Well, that might help. All right, those are the four laws of love. Priority, pursuit, which means to pursue them with all your energy, partnership, presentation, open, openness, nothing hidden. Can't have intimacy if you hide stuff. You can only be intimate in an environment that's open. All right. All right. Now, let me just mention this. You, you know when I'm saying the word intimate, that I'm not, I'm, not talk, I'm not just talking about sex, right? Intimacy is a condition. It, it, it's not an act. And, and it means that we know each other's heart. We know each other's dreams. We, 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 we're a team. We're together. Uh, uh, we can be open. I don't have to worry about you uh, hurting me and exposing me and using something against me, all that kind of stuff. You're my friend. You're my partner. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what this fourth law is about. All right, let's bow our head just real quick here. 